Matthew chapter 15, Mark chapter 7, same story, the same account given by two different Mark Gospel writers, Mark chapter, Matthew chapter 15, Mark chapter 7. We're going to read the Matthew one, we'll refer to the Mark passage as we go, but we won't read them both, but we'll read Matthew chapter 15 starting in verse 21. Matthew 15, 21. And then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. His disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away with her. For she cries out after us. And he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said to her, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. I won't say this word right because I don't know French. But in French there is the word en Frenchire, en Frenchier. And it means, what? Thank you. It means to make free. It's a word in French that means to free or to, to make free. It's, a, it's an actual action that someone does. If we take the word dis and add the word dis to it, it becomes disenfranchise. And the word disenfranchise means to make unfree or maybe better stated, to enslave. And again, it's an action. We, we remove someone's freedom, and in doing so, we enslave them. They become disenfranchised. And when we talk about a disenfranchised person or group, we're technically talking about a person's exclusion from the decision-making process or a decision-making process. Very literally, it means taking away someone's ability to vote. In a very narrow, in a very narrow sense, it simply means you don't get to have a say. You don't get to vote on this issue, whether it's a ballot or whether it's simply by a word or, or however. On a generic level, it's simply depriving them of being in the decision-making process. They become, in a sense, unfree. They are bound by whatever decision the governing body makes, and they simply have to comply. Now, the word has deeper meanings as well. You can expand the word disenfranchised. And a disenfranchised people is a person who has been stripped of their power, stripped of their ability to affect either their own life as well as society. They have no control over even their own life. If, if you look in history, in, in post-Civil War times, the post Civil War African Americans who fought in that war and who fought for the Emancipation Proclamation and that was all part of that. And yet after the war they were still stripped of their ability, their power to make decisions that affected them directly. Didn't have the right to vote, didn't have the right to have a right or have the right to have a say. So very disenfranchised at that point. <clears throat> If you make a list of disenfranchised people, it would be very different for probably each of us. It, in a sense, in a way, it can be very subjective as to how a person views a particular group or a particular person. Someone with limited mobility might feel disenfranchised because of physical barriers. They can't get to where they need to be because of stairs. Our sanctuary was that way for many, many, many years. If you couldn't do stairs, you can't worship with us. Sorry. Now we remedy, we rectified that, we remedied it, now everybody can come. 
That's a good thing. Physical barriers, uh, a group that becomes disenfranchised. People without a valid identification card or without valid identification are often excluded from the process or from different processes. Individuals with felony convictions are limited by the courts on what they can do and can't do. They become disenfranchised. Their power is taken away in some things. Individuals deemed mentally incompetent, undocumented immigrants, low-income individuals, people experiencing homelessness, women in the workplace, teenagers, particularly teenage girls, are, feel very, often feel very excluded, have a strong sense of being disenfranchised. Now, not all of us would agree with all of these categories, and maybe some that you come up with, I wouldn't agree with, as well as sometimes you can look at a group and say, well, you're disenfranchised because of how you live your life. This is your own fault. You're in that position because you acted badly or because you did something wrong. And, and that might be true, but the reality is that person is now disenfranchised. They cannot have power, or they do not have power in whatever area, and you, you know, pick an area, maybe uh, a wide-ranging area, it might be a very small area, but they have uh, feelings of no power. When we get to this account in the life of Jesus, and we get to this incident that happens, we find a woman who is ultimately affected powerfully by Jesus, but who falls into two categories of disenfranchisement. Number one, she was a woman. Sorry, the Bible is patriarchal. Not because that's how God made it, but because of the culture in which it was lived out. So she was disenfranchised because she was a woman. She was also becomes disenfranchised, removed from power, or removed from her ability to have a say because she was not Israel. She was not an Israelite. We'll talk about that both of those as we go through this. But if we look at the passage, first of all, we notice that it begins with Jesus simply trying to get away. He needs to, to get away and refresh and rejuvenate. And he goes up into an area of Phoenicia. He goes to two cities or near two cities. The two cities of Tyre and Sidon. And they are in an area called Phoenicia. They're about a, it's about 100 miles from Jerusalem. It's about 20 miles north of Galilee, outside the area of Galilee. So he's not even really in Israel proper anymore. There are Jews living in the area, but there's probably also a very large population of non-Jews who live in the area as well. And if you, if, as we read the account, it's almost as if Jesus went there because of that. Now, I call them non-Jews because <clears throat> when we meet the woman, Matthew calls her a woman of Canaan. Mark calls her a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth. But if you look at those, you think, well, which was she? Was she Greek? Or was she Canaanite? The reality is she is both. Those terms come to mean the same thing. In Jewish culture, in Jesus' day, there were two, four, there were two groups of people. There were Jews. There was everybody else. Even the Apostle Paul uses the term Greek to simply refer to Gentiles. It didn't necessarily mean you were from the nation of Greece. It simply meant you weren't, it meant you weren't Jewish. There were Jews and there were Greeks. And if you weren't a Jew, you were nobody. In fact, that's where the other phrase comes from. When he calls her, when they call her a Canaanite, when Mark calls her, I'm sorry, Matthew calls her a Canaanite, it's, it's almost derogatory. It's almost derogatory. When I grew up, not Elizabeth's not here. When I grew up in Western Montana, we used to tell North Dakotan jokes, okay? It wasn't, they weren't jokes of endearment. They were... Okay, but then I understand they told Montana jokes, so I guess we're even. But the term Canaanite was, I, was kind of a, a not derogatory in a, in a bold way, but kind of a slam on your ears as a Canaanite. You know, you're not Jewish. So the, the terms are not contradictory, simply one man referring to her one way, one man referring to her another way, but they mean the same thing. She wasn't Jewish. Now, in addition to that, uh, she didn't live in Israel. She was outside of Israel, even as a nation. So when we meet this mother and, and realize that she's a mom, and one of the reasons that Jesus cannot get away is because she's a mother. And, and I, I'm not going to expand on that a lot except to say that if your child is hurting, you'll do whatever you have to do to get it taken care of. This woman's child was hurting, and she was going to take care of it. She was going to get it dealt with one way or the other. So as we meet the woman, 
those two strikes against her. She was not Israelite. She was not from Israel. And she was a woman. So Jesus goes up here to get some R&R. &R. Mark records that he entered into a house and he wanted no one to know it. He didn't want anybody to know he was there. Not because he was hiding, but because he was hiding. And it's not uncommon, if you read through the Gospels, it's not uncommon for Jesus to slip away, even from his disciples, to find solitude, to commune with his Father, just to get away from the crowd. Uh, they mobbed him almost constantly when he, once he began his ministry. But here, it didn't work. And it didn't work because of a mother's love for her daughter. Matthew 22, or Matthew says, And behold, a woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. And then Mark simply states it differently. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet and kept asking him to cast the demon out. So this woman finds out Jesus is there. She knows who Jesus is, and so she begins to harass him. She wants her daughter healed. She has to have her daughter healed. She needs to have her daughter healed. And she comes to Jesus, and she becomes so annoying that the disciples even say to Jesus, Look, well, Matthew records, the disciples come and urge Jesus, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. Basically what they're saying is, Look, Lord, just give her what she wants. She's driving us nuts. She won't leave us alone. We came up here for some vacation time, and she won't stop harassing us with the request to heal her daughter. Just heal her daughter. Make her go away. <laughs> She's persistent. The woman comes, she makes a request. And Jesus ignores her. He won't even address her. He won't even acknowledge her presence. When the disciples come and ask him to just deal with her, he, he speaks to them. He won't even, he won't even address that she is there. He ignores her. There is a point when he does speak to her, but initially, just a woman, just a Canaanite, just a Greek, don't need this, go away. And so he didn't tell her to go away. Seems to treat her as Jewish society was treating her. Is Jesus rude? I'm not going to go into this too deeply today because that's not the point that I want to go into. But this is a hard passage because we see the actions of Jesus. And, and though we can explain them away to a certain degree, this is tough. This is tough. So we can say this. Well, Jesus was testing the woman's faith. Jesus, if you go down the end of the passage, that is, is, is somewhat vindicated that he does test her faith. He said, well, Jesus is testing your faith. We could also say... But Jesus is testing the disciples. Jesus is teaching the disciples a lesson. But at face value, that's hard. Those words are hard. You know, but they come to him and they come to him and go, Jesus, just get rid of him. He goes, what are you talking about? I'm not called to them. I'm called to Israel. They don't get the Messiah. Israel gets the Messiah. I'm not called except to the, to the house of Israel. It's a tough passage. God is, is trying to test. God is testing and teaching at the same time. <clears throat> as, we be, as we continue to prepare for the coming of Christ, and not just now, but as I prayed earlier throughout the year, look at the response of the woman. Okay, Notice her persistence. She's so persistent that the disciples are like, just get rid of her. Driving us nuts. Just give her a request so she goes away. How many, how many of you have been on a road trip traveling somewhere far and you hear this? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> Your mom and dad say it all the time, don't they? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? She touched me. Are we there yet? Now eventually the question gets answered with a yes, but the persistence can be very annoying. The woman did not give up. Her daughter was demon-possessed. 
She knew that that was not right. She knew that Jesus could help. Her love for her daughter would not allow her to give up. She was going to get her daughter healed. And it was going to happen now. Lord, son of David, cast the demon out of my daughter. Lord, son of David, cast the demon out of my daughter. Lord, son of David, cast the demon out of my daughter. Lord, son of David, cast the demon out of my daughter. Lord, son of David, cast the demon out of my daughter. Persistent, driven to do what she knew was right. How persistent are we in prayer? How persistent are we in prayer? If we know that it's God's will, if we know that it meets the criteria of God's plan, and we know that it does not cater to our own selfishness, then pound the gates of heaven until it's answered. Never stop. Beat the doors down until God finally says, fine, you can have it. Now, so some other things you'll find out about this lady that, that cushioned that a little bit. But be persistent in your prayer. Luke 11 says, Which of you shall have a friend and go into him at midnight and say to his friend, Friend, lend me three loaves, for, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I don't have anything to set before him. The friend will answer him and say, Don't trouble me. The door is shut. My children are in bed. I cannot, I cannot rise and give it to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give it to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him what he needs. So I say to you, ask, and ask, and ask, and ask, and ask, and it will be given unto you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened. No, has to fall under the guidelines of God's will. Do not put God over a barrel. <coughs> Do not force the hand of God. It never ends well. But this woman knew that it was not right for her daughter to be demon-possessed. That's easy. What are you pounding the gates of heaven for? Live as if God was your father. Pray as if he was your merciful father. So, first of all, persistent. The next thing we see about this woman is that she knows God. She knows this God of the Jews. She is not Jewish. She is Syrophoenician by birth. She is a Gentile. She is outside of the nation of Israel. But she knows this God. When she calls him the son of David, Lord, son of David, she, she's, what she's saying is, I know that you are the Jewish Messiah. I know that you are the Jewish Savior. Somewhere, somehow, she picked up this knowledge of who God was, who Jesus is. She comes and addresses him not just as a prophet or a teacher or a good person. She addresses him as the Messiah, Lord, Son of David. She knew Jesus. How she got it, we're not told. She knew Jesus. Let me ask you this question. How is your knowledge of God? How well do you know God? Are you up on what's right and what's wrong? Do you know what offends God and what doesn't offend God? Do you know what God is looking for? Do you know who God is? Take out a piece of paper and pencil. Write on your bulletin. Write on your back of your neighbor's hand. Whatever. I'm going to give you some information that you're going to need. Okay? I want you to write this down and it will put you in good stead someday. Okay? Ready? Ready? Here we go. When you meet the Queen of England, here's the rules. Don't touch. Okay? Don't touch. If she extends her hand to you, shake it. Don't grip it. Don't pump it. Touch it like you go back. Do not kiss. Do not hug. Do not touch her on the shoulder. Women, curtsy slightly. Men, bow your head slightly. Don't turn your back to the Queen. It's rude. Just don't do that. You getting this down? <laughs> When you address her initially, refer to as your, her as your majesty. On subsequent greetings, you can use the term ma'am. You don't need to continue saying your majesty. Do not call her by any nicknames. I do not know any nicknames for the queen. <laughs> do not ask her about her famous grandsons, Prince Harry and Prince William. Not appropriate. At meals, do not chow down. Okay? Tea will be served with small snacks. When drinking the tea, pick up the cup only, take a sip, put it down after every sip, and don't slurp. 
by the way, when the queen stops eating, you stop eating. When she's done, you're done. Proper etiquette. Got that down? When you meet the Queen of England, now you know how to act. Do we know the God to whom, from whom we are seeking answers? Do we know God, or do we just go, yeah, here we go, God, just give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. No. Somehow she knew God. Somehow she, she learned who he was and, and, and how to address him and, and how to respond. And, and on that same note, it says later that she came and she worshipped him. Now the Greek word is very uh, very active. She, she bowed down and even it could include that she kissed his feet or that she laid flat in front of him or that she kissed his hand, but she bowed before him. She not only understood about him, she knew who he was. And in knowing that, she knew her place. She bowed with him before him because she was outside of Israel, because she was a woman, and because she is, because he is God. She recognized her place in the presence of the Messiah. Do you know whom you address when you go to prayer? It's not your equal. Okay? He's not your equal. He's not your servant. He's not your answer giver. If you look at this passage, he's not even your friend. He's God. He's Almighty God. Okay? And you will address him as such, or you will not get an audience. You will approach God as God, not as a person, not as your friend, not as your grandfather in heaven. Not as a nice guy. You will approach him as God. I talked in Sunday school this today a little bit about the fact that, that God dwells in unapproachable light. That God is powerful. His voice shakes the mountains. We are terrified of that. While at the same time being drawn into that. Do you know whom you are approaching when you go to God? Or do you treat him like your buddy? He's not your buddy. And don't ever treat him like that. He loves us. He cares for us. He's not our friend. He is God. To use a, a quote or an illustration that is somewhat maybe overused, but I'll use it anyway. In the story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, there's a conversation between Beaver and Susan, and Beaver says, Well, Aslan is a lion. The lion. The great lion. Oh, said Susan, I, I thought he was a man. Is he is he quite safe? I would feel rather nervous bowing to a lion, meeting a lion. Beaver responds, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he's not safe. But he's good. He's the king. You come to God, let me pray to him. Don't never forget who you're talking to. He is good. He is kind. He is merciful. He cares about you. But he is not a person. He is God. And when we address him, we bow before him and we prostrate before him and we kiss his feet because he is God. Too often, people address God as if he's just another thing, another way to get our way. He will not answer you. He not have to answer you. <clears throat> Finally, we look at the woman. She knew anything from Jesus was better than everything. From people. Anything from Jesus is better than everything from people. Jesus said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, but even the little dogs that eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. I want you to notice something in that. He said, I think The King James, I believe, says dogs. You don't throw the bread to the dogs. The, the term there it used is actually the term for puppy. There is, a, there is a New Testament Greek word for dog. And it was used derogatorily most of the time by Jews. But Jesus doesn't even give her the honor of calling her a full-grown dog. She's a puppy. She's a little dog. She's not even a good dog. She's just a worthless dog. <laughs> and yet she says, you know, Lord, even the, even the little dogs... Glean something from the crumbs that fall from the master's table. <clears throat> she, 
she knew that Jesus had power to heal. And she also knew that Jesus looked at a person's faith, not their DNA. Jesus doesn't care what Ancestry.com says your DNA is. I'm not sure how accurate they're in. She did not Jesus to, she did not need Jesus to move heaven and earth. She needed Jesus to heal her daughter. She needed Jesus to make her daughter's life good again. And she knew he could. And she believed that he would. We come to him. We come to Jesus. As we prepare for this time, we need to be persistent. We need to come with that prayer that we know is right and not give it up. Not let it go until God answers. We need to come knowing who He is. We address Him as the King of the Jews. We address Him as the Son of David, the Messiah. And we come appropriately, knowing our place. We come on our knees. We bow before Him. Some people ask me, why do we bow down and bow our heads when we pray? Because He's God. He deserves that. The same reason you don't touch the Queen. Because He's God. And then we receive, we receive whatever God gives us. Receive whatever God gives us. And that's enough. That's enough. There are several examples in the scripture of, of people, of God giving people the opportunity. The, the, the one that comes to mind is David had sinned, and in his sin, 70,000 Israelites died. And God said to him, look, here's your choice. I'll give you into the hands of your enemy for X number of months, or I'm going to send a plague through you. Or this, and David says, Lord, this, I want to be in your hands because your punishment is more merciful than the mercy of, of humans, of people. Receive from God whatever he gives. As you prepare for Advent, the coming of the King, be persistent, know who he is, know our place, and receive what he has for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we